you ever want D&D &D and a mobile game paired together? Probably not. And I'll be honest, neither do I. But apparently, D&D &D Beyond presents Dark Tides of Bilgewater, Legends of Runeterra. A co-sort of combination from D&D &D Beyond and Legends of Runeterra, the collectible card mobile game. Um, so I'm going to be going through that, but more importantly, folks, there are three official published subclasses and several magic items that are introduced in this new module that came out of nowhere like an hour ago. So if you want to see what that is, stay tuned. I guess it's pirate themed, so are we be pirates or something? There it is. On D&D Beyond. You can see you can present it by Google Play and Legends of Runeterra. You can go here and download the game. Uh, but we don't care about that because we're here for Dungeons & Dragons. So here it is. Uh, and you can see it has a setting guide here. And more importantly, Heroes and Scoundrels of Bilgewater. So it tells you what races to choose. Select Human as your race and select Barbarian, Fighter, or Rogue as your subclass. I'm assuming this is you are trying to be... You're trying to play in the world of Runeterra based on this. So there are three new subclasses. Uh, we have Path of the Depths Barbarian. So level three, you get Gift of the Drowned One. You gain a swimming speed equal to your walking speed and the ability to breathe underwater. Dredge Line also at level three. Uh, while you're raging, you, you gain an extra appendage, which can appear as a Kraken Tentacle, a Giant act, uh, Anchor, preternatural jaws or something else based on your history as a bonus action you can use this appendage to strike at one creature of your choice that you can see within 15 feet target must make a saving throw a strength saving throw tied to your strength or be pulled to 10 feet in a straight line towards you at six level you get ghost water dive you magically teleport um i'm oh, sorry you can burst into water then materialize somewhere else as an action you magically teleport along with any equipment you are wearing or carrying up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space you can see. Before or after teleporting, you can make one attack as part of your action. Moving in this way does not provoke attacks of opportunity. So this is a phenomenal, maybe even a little OP-ish ability here. So this is, you're a barbarian, you normally get two attacks. This is giving you a free teleport that is unlimited usage uh, 30 foot teleport so it's basically misty step but it's an action but it's an action and you can still make an attack dirt as part of this teleportation um so that's pretty nutty uh at 10 you get manifestations of the deep um and it says you get to manifest additional adaptations of the deep select an option from below uh during a long rest you may replace one of your chosen manifestations with a new option from the list Eye of the Deep, you can use Echolocation. When you do so, you can cast True Seeing without expending a spell slot or using material components. Uh, after you cast a spell in this way, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Arms of the Deep, while raging, you can now manifest two appendages, which may be tentacles, chains, anchors, etc. When you use your Dredge Line ability, you can attempt a grapple with each of your appendages. Heart of the Deep, now on your turn, you can use a bonus action to gain temporary hit points equal to a D12 plus your Barbarian level once per short or long rest. I'm sorry, my child is leaping off the couch, I guess, and my wife's just letting it happen, so it is what it is. Uh, Soul of the Deep, you're now immune to all effects that would cause you to be charmed or frightened. Or Armor of the Deep, you get a plus one bonus to your AC. Reminder, you only get one of those but at the end of a long rest, you can change it to pick which one you want. And lastly, you get Depth Charge at level 14. When you appear, um, let's see, uh, when you use your Ghost Water Dive ability, that's your teleportation. Uh, when you appear, all creatures within 10 feet of you must make a Strength saving throw. Uh, not of your choice, just all creatures. On a failed save, a creature takes 3d6 force damage and is knocked prone. On a successful save, they take half damage and they're not knocked prone. So right there, this is going to get you... This is a pretty powerful... Uh, I mean, it's all underwater themed, but it's still pretty powerful overall. You're going to get the swim speed, breathing underwater, this extra tentacle, which can be used to pull someone to you as a bonus action, which is good, because typically as a barbarian, your first turn is going to be uh, bonus action rage, and then you may not have access to a good bonus action. Teleportation as a barbarian is very, very limited, uh, and the fact that it's teleportation and you also get to make an attack as part of it is great. And then at 14, it's not only an attack 
and a teleportation is also an AoE force damage attack uh, against all creatures within 10 feet. That's a pretty sizable radius and knocked prone. So, uh, and it's when you appear, so you appear and then you can make the attack. So you can teleport as an action, make people uh, take this damage. If they fail, they're knocked prone and then you can choose to make your, att your attack with advantage on top of that. Um, and then you could potentially use your bonus action to pull somebody to you as well. There's all sorts of nutty options for this. And then at 6th level, as an action, you can... Uh, I'm sorry, at 10th level, you get to choose your, your manifestation, which true seeing is something I don't think a barbarian will, is ever going to get access to. Um, so that's pretty good. True seeing's duration is an hour non-concentration. Uh, the arms of the deep is two appendages, and you can now attempt to grapple with each of them, which means as a bonus action, you can make two grapple attempts. Um... The temporary hit points is always nice as a barbarian boosting up your temp hit points. It is only once per short rest, but a d12 plus your barbarian level is not a small amount. And then flat out immunity to charm and frightened are very powerful, uh, very good to have. And then, you know, an AC is not bad. It's kind of my least favorite of the bunch. So that is the barbarian subclass. So let's now move on to the fighter subclass, which is making guns and gunslingery types cannon to Dungeons and Dragons. So for the new fighter archetype, we have the Renegade. At third level, you're gonna get proficiency with two of the following skills, deception, persuasion, or sleight of hand. And then you're gonna get gunfighter form. Additionally, when you choose this archetype at second level, or sorry, at third level, you begin constructing a custom firearm that suits your unique brand of Renegade style. This process begins by selecting the form upon which you base your weapon. Choose one of the following options, each form gains you a new ability and unlocks certain upgrades you can add to your weapon at higher levels. Your options are Pistolier or Sniper. Uh, favoring speed and style over raw power, a renegade who adopts the Pistolier form wields a small flintlock handgun. As an action on your turn, you can target a creature within 30 feet and shoot. Make a ranged attack against that target, you're proficient with it, and on a hit it does a d6 piercing plus your dex mod. The number of shots you can fire during a single action increase when you reach higher levels in the subclass. Two shots at fifth level, three shots at 11th level, and four shots at 20th level. The shots can target the same creature or different creature and make a separate roll for each attack. So essentially, you start off with one attack, and then obviously action surge would be that. So uh, it's a flintlock pistol. I'll be honest with you, as someone who's shot flintlocks before, uh, doing four shots in six seconds is impossible. You will never, I mean, we're talking real world physics here. You're never going to be able to shoot six flintlock shots in uh, four flintlock shots in six seconds. And you might not even be able to do one. I guess you could do one if you were primed and set up. But anyway, I'm, I'm digressing here. Uh, but I like that concept. It keeps it simple. You can do one shot and it sort of almost has like the loading property. But as you level up to when you would be getting additional attacks, you get an additional shot. So I like that. Uh, or Sniper, armed with a large two-handed firearm, a renegade who adapts uh, the sniper form can inflict massive damage with a single shot. As an action on your turn, you can target a creature within 120 feet, make an attack roll against them, you're proficient, and it deals a d10 plus dex mod in uh, damage. Your extra damage, uh, you deal extra damage with this form when you reach higher levels, dealing 2d10 at 5th level, 4d10 at 11th level, and 6d10 at 20th level. The I guess the downside of this is you are making a singular attack. As a fighter, it seems almost uh, blasphemous to be limiting yourself to an action to do one attack, but your one attack at 5th level is doing 2d10 plus your dexterity modifier. Realistically, if you hit and you have, I guess if you had a d10 weapon, you could, in theory, do a d10 plus your dex mod twice uh but at four at 11th level it's 4 d10 plus your dexterity modifier so that in theory might be more powerful than you being able to do three attacks again action surge is still part of this so you could do two attacks in a row with action surge also weapon of choice uh through a combination of salvaging stolen pieces of arcane tech and sheer rackish ingenuity you can customize your firearm with various upgrades when you choose this archetype at third level, pick one minor upgrade and one major upgrade from the firearm upgrades list at the end of the subclass. If an upgrade has a prerequisite, you must meet that first. You gain an additional minor upgrade at fifth level and one major upgrade at 10th level. That's really cool. I'm excited to see what that is. At seventh level, you get cunning shot. 
Uh, damage dealt by your firearm, including via upgrades, ignores resistance and immunities. <laughs> what? That's bananas. Immunity to peer like so. It's not technically a magic weapon, so it doesn't overcome resistance or immunity to magic weapons. But it doesn't matter because it just ignores it. Uh, at tenth level, when you use your second wind feature, you gain an AC uh, plus one to your AC, and your movement speed increases by ten feet until the start of your next turn. I like that, as I stated before in my Purple Dragon Knight fixing video, I like things that are going to expand and make additional uses and be better ways to utilize existing features. At 15, you get right gun for the job. When you finish a long rest, you can replace any of your firearm upgrades with a different one, though you cannot have more than two major upgrades equipped at a time. You must still meet the prerequisites for it. All right, getting some versatility there. And at 18, you get light them up. As a bonus action, you can either throw down or set up a small explosive. If thrown, the explosive has a range of 30 feet and detonates immediately on impact. If set down, uh, explosive can be detonated remotely from up to 60 feet away as another bonus action. So not the same turn. When detonated, each creature within a 15 foot radius of the explosion must make a dexterity saving throw. Taking 12d6 force damage on a failure or half on a success, that's not too bad. Uh, and the DC for this saving throw is equal to your firearm upgrade DC. I guess we'll see what that is shortly. Once you finish this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. All right, so here are our upgrades. It's based off your charisma modifier, interestingly enough. So that's kind of unique. All right, so there's blade and black powder, minor firearm upgrade. Um, let's see, uh... You create a matching blade. Being within five feet of a hostile creature doesn't impose disadvantage. It's only for the pistol, by the way. Doesn't impose disadvantage on your ranged attack rolls. Additionally, when you use your action to shoot from your gunfighter form, uh, you can use your bonus action to strike at a creature within melee range. Make a melee attack roll. The attack uses your dexterity modifier. You're proficient with it. On a hit, it deals slashing damage equal to a d6 plus your dex mod. So that's really good because you can technically be using the pistol and a shield, right? In, in theory, you can do that. Uh, and now with this, you can still attack and gain additional attacks as you level up, although you're stuck doing a D6 damage. But you can also now make a bonus action attack, and that's a minor upgrade. Remember, you get to choose a minor and a major upgrade at, uh, you get both when you get the gun at level three. Uh, there's the caliber net. By repurposing some of the salvage ha uh, Hextech parks you equip your gun with, an arcane net meant to trap opponents. As an action, choose a creature within a range of your firearm. The creature must succeed on a strength saving throw or be restrained. At the end of each of its turn, it can repeat the saving throw, ending the effect on a success. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again to finish a short or long rest. That's awesome. I love that. Uh, ranged restraint is very cool. Collateral damage, this is sniper only. When you hit a target with a successful attack from your firearm, all creatures within five feet of the target must succeed on a dex saving throw or take 1d6 piercing damage. I like that thematically it doesn't really work as a sniper. You should maybe have like a penetrating shot where it goes through multiple targets. But either way, extra damage, I'm not going to say no to that. And the minor, these are all minor upgrades. Crosshairs at fifth level. If your target hasn't moved this turn, you can aim down your sights as a bonus action, reducing your speed to zero and granting yourself advantage on all attacks you make with your gunfighter form. Oh, I really like that. That's like an aim thing. I always wish we had that in fifth edition. Double barrel for your sniper at fifth level. Uh, when you use your gunfighter form, you can shoot twice during a single action instead of once. The shots can target the same creature. This is really powerful. Because that that damage that we talked about scaling, this will this will even out pretty easily. Uh, smoke screen as an action, you alter the firing mechanism of your gun to release a burst of ash or smoke. This cloud forms a ten foot cube centered on a point of your choice within the firearm's range, spreading around corners, and the area covered by the cube is considered heavily obscured. It lasts for ten minutes and can't be dispersed. Just period, can't be. Uh, once you use this feature, you can't use it again to finish a short or long rest. So those are all minor upgrades. A reminder that you'll have a grand total of two minor upgrades on your weapon uh, when you hit fifth level. And at, at 15th level, you can swap the upgrades. And then you'll have a total of two major upgrades. One you get at third level, another at 10th. And let's go over those. So barrage. As an action, you fire a barrage of bullets. Each creature in a 15-foot cone originating from yourself must make a dex save or take piercing damage equal to 3d10 plus a dex mod on a fail or half on a success once per short or long rest. It seems like all of the major upgrades are short or long rest abilities. 
Uh, double up. When you hit a creature with a successful ranged attack with a firearm, you can immediately cause the bullet to hit another creature within 15 feet of the original target. It's like a ricochet shot. The target takes piercing damage equal to your dex mod. You can redirect a bullet in this way a number... Oh! You can redirect a bullet in this way a number of times equal to your charisma modifier. So in theory, if you have max charisma and max dex, this thing can like bing, 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 and get up to five total targets. Uh, it is just dex mod damage, no roll, but that's still additional damage. That's, and just the, the visual of that is very cool. Uh, lightning round. Uh, the lightning, uh, let's see, you can fire a of piercing, piercing electricity as an action on your turn. The lightning fires from you in a straight line that is one foot wide and 30 feet long. Each creature in the line must make a dex save or take 3d8 lightning damage on a fail, half on a success. This is once per short rest, um, short or long rest. And then trial by fire as a bonus action, you can charge your weapons with blazing force. Until the end of your next turn, whenever you make a successful attack, you deal extra fire damage equal to half your fighter level rounded up. You can charge your weapons this way a number of times equal to your charisma modifier and regain all uses after a short or long rest. I love this class. Whoever wrote this, I don't know who it did. I know I saw a couple of people. I saw Todd Kenrick and Celeste and I think Mackenzie, a whole bunch of different people were. This is masterful, I would say. This is very well done. I'm a guns in D&D are it's you know it's tricky right that's hard to deal with we saw matt Ma uh, mercer's gunslinger and i always kind of felt that that was a little op and kind of funky with the grit mechanic this folks is how you do it this is expertly crafted i really like this this is a fighter i would play right i mean that's not that's coming for me i feel like that's a very high praise because i don't play fighter characters because i don't enjoy them this i would i really like it I like the idea of being the pistol and uh, a pistol and shield. I think that's a cool concept. But the sniper with the double barrel and shooting lightning and charging up fire. If you ever played Guild Wars 2, this reminds me immensely of the engineer from Guild Wars 2. And that is a class that I very much liked, a profession from that game that I very much enjoyed. This chef kiss. And lastly, we have the rogue archetype, the wild card. So uh, your penchant for games has afforded you the ability to subtly manipulate fortune to your favor. When you choose this archetype at third level, you can learn the guidance cantrip. Starting at ninth level, it has a range of 30 feet for you and you could do it as a bonus action. Oh my God, guidance is one of the, is one of the best cantrips, if not, one, if not the best cantrip and a contender for one of the best spells in the game. The fact that it can become a bonus action for you and have a 30 foot range is ridiculous. And I love it. Uh, wild cards gambit at third level you get proficiency in one of the following sets dice set dragons chess set or playing card set uh, the gaming set you choose grants you a wild cards gambit as detailed below if you are proficient in multiple types of gaming set you must choose which gambit you choose when you gain this feature uh, you can change the choice of gambit whenever you gain a level in the class okay loaded dice you gain a pool of d6s equal to the number of d6s you roll for your sneak attack damage if your pool starts uh, your pool starts with 2d6 at third level, 3d6 at five, and so on. When a creature targets you with an attack, you can use your reaction to spend one die from your pool and subtract the number from the attack. You can choose to use this feature after the creature makes the roll, but before the DM determines if it's a hit or miss. Starting at ninth level, you can do two dice from your pool, and 17th level, you can spend three dice from your pool. You're, you regain all expended dice from your loaded dice pool when you complete a long rest. So what's cool is I was originally thinking uh, what cool concept I thought would be neat is if you spend them, then you don't get to use them for sneak attack. So that was like a trade off. But that's not the case. It's just a pool equal to those dice. So you basically have cutting words to reduce an attack roll as a uh, as a rogue. But it's D6 is potentially up to three of these dice to reduce the attack roll. That's an interesting concept for a rogue because you have uncanny dodge where you could have the damage, but this may potentially make it miss entirely. Uh, and then you don't have to worry about taking half of that damage. For dragon chess set, uh, you get a prowess with a chess board. As a bonus action on your turn, you can execute one of the following chess maneuvers. You can use a bonus action in this way a number of times equal to your charisma modifier and regain all uses on a long rest. Dragon. Choose a creature you can see within 30 feet. The first time that creature makes a successful attack roll before the start of the next turn, they deal extra damage equal to your level in the class. That's a very... I really like this class so far. 
because it's good support as a rogue, which is usually not what rogues do. They're usually just all about the damage. Uh, Griffin, your movement speed increases by 10 feet and your movement does not provoke attacks of opportunity. These benefits last until the start of your next turn. That's a great way to not have to take mobile as a rogue. And Slyph, or Sylph, rather, you and all friendly creatures within five feet of you have advantage on deck saves until the start of your next turn. So you can do this as a bonus action, charisma modifier times, prolonged rest. Or if you choose playing cards, uh, you have your own deck of enchanted cards. You can take their razor sharp. Oh, Gambit, we're Gambit. This is amazing. Uh, you can make their, razor, their edges razor sharp with a flick of your wrist. If you've not yet used your sneak attack this turn, you can use your action to take one of these cards and attack a creature within 30 feet of you. The attack roll uses your dex mod, deals slashing damage equal to a d4, so it's a dagger, basically. When you roll damage, look at the number rolled on the d4. The attack gains a random effect based on the number rolled, as detailed in the wild card suit below. You can attack using a card in this manner a number of times equal to your charisma modifier per long rest. Um, I think it, it can it benefit from sneak attack? It's a ranged weapon, so yeah, I guess so. Um, all right, if you roll a one, blade, roll your sneak attack damage and add it to the razor's card damage. At the start of its next turn, the target takes additional damage equal to half, so sort of like a bleeding effect. Shackle until the start of your next turn. The target's speed is halved. It can't take more than one. Uh, can't make more than one attack on its turn while its speed is reduced in this way. Heart. Roll your sneak attack damage and add it to your razor's card uh, damage. You also immediately gain regain a number of hit points equal to the damage dealt. Any excess hit points become temporary hit points. That's a feature I love to see in any class. Uh, and then Wild Ace with a four. This card morphs uh, suits depending on the dealer's wishes. Choose Blade, Shackle, or Heart. The card immediately gains the suit's respective effect. Okay. So I guess it doesn't apply sneak attack damage unless this thing tells you to do it. That's how I'm how I'm interpreting it. Uh, shifting the odds at level 9. As a bonus action, you can disappear with a dramatic flourish. Each creature within 10 feet of you must make a dexterity saving throw, taking 40 10 force damage on a failed save or half on a success. You then teleport yourself to an unoccupied space you can see within 120 feet, which is pretty nice. Once you use this ability, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. So this is a bonus action, 120-foot teleport AoE move, uh, key with the DC keyed off your charisma modifier. Again, I love that. 13, Twist of Fate. After rolling initiative before the first turn of combat, you can choose to swap places in the initiative order with one creature you can see. If the creature is one of your allies, the ally must agree to swapping initiative with you. So you can actually swap initiative with an enemy. Um, but to see, that's interesting because what if you don't tell your players, so this is tricky after rolling initiative, but before the first turn of combat, you can swap places in the initiative order with one creature you can see. Oh, okay. My mistake with a creature you can see. So I was thinking like, if you don't, if the DM doesn't tell you what the initiative order is, like have initiative tent cards or something, you don't get to know when they go. Uh, but it's you pick, like, I want to swap initiative with that guy. Um, obviously you'll know the party's initiative because you're all rolling, but you may not know when the enemies come in the order. So, okay, swap it, and the allies have to choose to swap. And then lastly, at 17, you get Joker Wild. As a bonus action on your turn, you can take an incorporeal form during which you gain the following benefits. You regain expended uh, power for your wild, you regain expended power for your wild card gambits feature. Cards, you regain, uh, um, I guess as a bonus action, you just get them back. So you get all spent cards back, uh, all spent uses of that feature. Dragon chess, regain all spent uses of that. Or the dice, you get all spent dice. So basically, if you've used up any of the abilities given by the wild cards gambit, you get them all back as a bonus action. Your movement speed is doubled. You gain resistance to all damage and are immune to grappled, paralyzed, stun, restrained conditions. You can move through objects and creatures as if they were difficult terrain. And if you end your turn inside a creature, you take a d10. Oh, sorry, the creature takes a d10 force damage and is shunted into a space within five feet of their original location. So you can actually use this to hurt people. Um, you can move through objects and creatures as if they were difficult terrain. And if you end your turn inside a creature, the creature takes a d10 force damage. Yeah, so you can actually use this to move and damage creatures as well. This incorporeal state lasts for one minute or until you're incapacitated. Once you use this feature, you cannot use it again until you complete a long rest. That makes sense to me. It's in your incorporeal, 
so people can still see you from what I'm understanding because you're just insubstantial. Um, so they like I was gonna say it's not like auto sneak attack because they can't see you; they just can't really harm you. That's a f these are the the barbarian one. I like that it has options. It's definitely my least favorite out of the three. I do like a lot of the way it. Ha I like the teleport. I like the options of manifestations of the deep. The renegade gunslinger type here, phenomenal. I love that, and I really like this this uh, roguish archetype, the wild card, because I like that it actually uses gaming sets. Because I feel like that's one of the least used and kind of the most pointless uh, sets of like tool proficiencies you can get, and this makes it actually important. Plus, if I want to be Gambit. Now, they have this guy looking kind of like Gambit in here, like he's charging up his cards uh, with some kinetic energy. Obviously, they don't get to do that, but they still can throw the cards and deal damage, and that's pretty freaking cool. I love this. I originally was really lukewarm on the concept of this, like, where I cross over between D&D &D and a mobile card game. So I haven't played Legends of Runeterra, I'll be honest with you. I'm probably not going to. I think it's by Riot Games, um, another company that made it. Um, so there's not too much more to do here. There is a adventure section. A two, there's an adventure section, a beast section, and a, a booty section for the magic items. I'm not really going to touch on the adventure. I can, I guess, if you guys really want to. But there are uh, maybe 10 new monsters and several new magic items. So I guess I'm going to be doing two videos after this. One on the Beasts of Bilgewater and one on the Booty of Bilgewater. The magic items are pretty cool. I haven't looked at the monsters, but one of them is called a Dragon Shark. And, you know, what more can you ask for? So anyway, let me know what your guys' thoughts are. This totally came out of nowhere to me. Blew my mind. Was not expecting it. But hey, this is awesome. New options. Just when I started getting back on a regular upload schedule, we got new content. That's about how that goes. So let me know what your thoughts are. What's your favorite? What are your thoughts on these subclasses? OP, UP, what do you feel about them? Uh, so yeah, I'm curious. Leave me all of your thoughts in the comments. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. Thanks to my patrons over on Patreon for supporting me. Thank you to all of you for subscribing to the channel. We are eking in on 40,000 subscribers here. Uh, so if you haven't subscribed and you like the content that I'm doing, I would really appreciate it if you subscribed. Probably ring that notification bell because obviously videos like this come out out of nowhere. Uh, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.